Hey folks, good afternoon and welcome to another one of our TESS seminars. And as you all know, TESS is our Center for Tropical, Environmental, and Sustainability Science here at JCU, which is our main forum for terrestrial environmental research. We're pretty happy with TESS. We think it's doing some, some pretty good things, including bringing in really, really fascinating speakers to talk about amazingly important and interesting parts of the world. So I'll go ahead and I just wanted to remind you that the next... Uh, excuse me, uh, this week, of course, is obviously uh, Easter holiday. Next week, we will not have a test seminar. It will be in, in uh, recess for that, for I think a study recess. Uh, and then we'll be coming back. I will be away for three weeks because I'll be traveling in the U.S. So I won't see you guys for almost a month then. Anyway, we'll turn things over to Zoe, who's now going to introduce John and tell us about his uh, talk today. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Um, again, welcome to TED Seminar. My name is Zoe, and I'm a lecturer here at JC JCU in Development Study. And John is visiting JCU to collaborate on a project with me, and we are looking at the experience of uh, temporary migrant workers, such as backpacker, and their experience and their contribution to rural and um, regional development in Australia. But beyond Australia, John has extensive experience in the Pacific. And John has more than 250 paper publications and more than 40 books. And its number is still counting. And I think the majority of his work has been on the Pacific. Um, and I have to say, John is the most interesting human geographer I know. but um, I will let you to decide whether this statement is fair or not after today's talk. So thank you, John. Well, I don't think I've ever been introduced as the most interesting speaker. So it's a pretty hard one to, to live up to that. Um, but it is nice to be here and thank you for Zoe for inviting me. And I'll try and give a sort of human perspective to some of the changes that I've seen in one part of Papua New Guinea over the last um, almost half a century. Um, so uh, the title I've chosen is, uh, the title of actually a chapter of a book which reflects on some of this, Olga to Lapuni Daipin. It's, it's all uh, the old men have died. And people told me that the last time I was back six years ago, they'd look at me and say, oh, your friends have all died. All the old men have gone. But there was more than that. It was their wisdom has gone too. Their knowledge has disappeared with them. So there was the sadness both of their deaths, the sadness that I was the only old man left, and the sadness that knowledge and wisdom was disappearing as they went. Um, <clears throat> okay, I guess we all, you all know here certainly where Papua New Guinea is. Uh, it's important though to, to remember that the, the Bougainville is the easternmost island in uh, Papua New Guinea. It's similar to the Western Solomon Islands, populated by black skinned people rather than more redder, browner skinned people of other parts of Papua New Guinea. Um, and this is, uh, this is obviously Bougain, Bougainville itself. It's, I have to bring two maps as a card carrying geographer, it's important to, to do that. Um, but it's also important to say that this is, uh, this is an island of, depending on what time I'm talking about, now about 300,000 people, which is sought to become independent from the rest of Papua New Guinea in a referendum of uh, three years ago. 98% um, people voted in favour of it. It's also an island which is um, volcanic. There are three active volcanoes on the island. Uh, there are roughly 40 earthquakes a year, so it's a very tectonically uh, interesting island. Uh, the place I'm going to talk about, Suai, um, is basically underneath that A of Papua New Guinea. So that's where it is. Um, I'll put another map in a moment. Um, it's on a dissected plain to the south of the island. And again, uh, as we'll see from the next map, Suai and Bougainville are the most distant places from the capital of, uh, of Papua New Guinea. <clears throat> okay, so that's a starting point, just for geography about where, where these places are. Um, and I think if we, most of us from outside know anything about Bougainville at all, it is for two things. One is the independence referendum of three years ago when 98% sought to become a separate state within Papua New Guinea. 
And secondly, because of the mine, uh, which was there in the center of the island. Maybe this, there was a pointer that somebody took it away again. Um, the, uh, an island which was vitally important for 20 years, was a major source of, of economic wealth, um, collapsed after 20 years in the violence and the civil war and has been closed ever since. Um, but it's right in the middle of the island, west of Panguna town, as you can see, and it brought linkages between the East and the West. So that was also an important part <coughs> of the background to what I'm talking about. Okay, um, so most of the pictures I'm going to show you, well, all the pictures I'm going to show you from the last time I was back there, which was six years ago. Um, when you arrive at Booker, the first thing you see is a huge poster. Look out in you yet along AIDS. Uh, watch out for yourself because of AIDS. And a reminder that before COVID, there were other kinds of epidemics and crises as well. So it's sort of daunting when you first arrive in a place to be confronted by, by that particular poster. Um, two of my old friends, you can see why I sort of felt at home when, when I got back there. And indeed, as a South Sydney supporter, I felt particularly at home. Uh, and my neighbor in the village was wearing the right kind of cap. So here I am, at least talking to some, um, not people not as old as me, uh, but still uh, advanced in years. Okay, so the island has been, Bougainville has been incorporated into the wider world in some senses, only really since the start of the last century. The first Christian mission um, on the island was in 1902. The first Christian mission that reached Siwa in South, uh, South Bougainville, where I'm talking about, was 100 years ago in 1920. So there's a century of missionization, and that was the beginning of important changes. Um, plantations arrived uh, in the German area, particularly in the Australian area, and that was the beginning of a source of wealth that trickled back through the workers working on the plantations, going back to their home villages. The mine brought dramatically in the 1960s and 70s, a massive change to the island um, through, through mining itself, through urbanization, through an extraordinary amount of wealth from employment, from, uh, uh, from compensation payments and so on and so forth. Papua New Guinea became independent, as we know, uh, 47 years ago um, in Bougainville that was celebrated as the Republic of the North Solomons. But what I'm trying to say is that there's very growing complexity here, uh, particularly as the mine was established, particularly as independence happened, the economies became much more diverse, the actors involved were more diverse, the environments they were working in became more complex and so on. Okay, then um, <clears throat> there was a crisis, I don't want to dwell on that, um, but essentially it closed the mine for, uh, after 20 years of life, the mine is still closed 30 years later. Um, and there's all kinds of discussions now about if Bougainville were to become independent, what would be the status of the mine, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of things we don't really know, but it's against this background of change and it's against this background of a crisis uh, in the middle of this process of change that I'm going to talk. This is what the mine site looks like now of a, a grass growing, growing over the site. People were panning for gold at the mine site itself. The first time I went back there, just after the crisis, 1901, uh, sorry, 1901, I'm not that old, uh, 2001, um, we crossed over the top, uh, past the mine itself, and I was told that I was the first European who'd ever done it because it was totally illegal. And they said, but don't worry, if anybody shoots you, just lie down, we'll tell them you're the new missionary. So I instantly started practicing a few more prayers than I normally use. Um, the, the urban area collapsed as well and so on. So now, what I want to talk about then is, is what we do when we go back to places, in a sense. Um, this is because um, not just me, but a, a long time before me, um, there was, I'm going to pass this book around, the microphone's there, I'm not allowed to speak while I'm going to pass this book. Um, okay, so in 1939, uh, the professor of anthropology um, 
then at Harvard, now who finished up at the University of Hawaii before he died a few years ago, Douglas Oliver wrote this a definitive book on this particular group of people, the CY people. The book was published in 1955. So we have through that book, and I think I'm passing you around because there's some nice pictures. And it's nice to look at those pictures and compare them with the pictures I will show you. And I, I haven't got them up here, so they're only there. So have a quick look at those pictures as they go by. So Douglas Oliver was there just before the Second World War. So we now have a sort of trajectory from 1939, what he was writing about, and he was an unusual anthropologist that he provided a lot of detail on what has happened in the intervening years. I first went there in 1974, um, a couple of, couple of more times before the end of the, the last century. Then came the crisis. Um, I went back again in 2001, 2016. Um, Good question is whether I will go back again. I was supposed to go back a couple of years ago, but COVID prevented that. But it may happen. Not many people do these kinds of longitudinal studies. It's worthwhile asking, I think, particularly in social science, why that doesn't really happen. Most people go, do a PhD, write it up, like Douglas Oliver did in that book, don't ever normally go back again. Or if they do, they go back for a very short time period. And I'll come back on, on to that in a moment. Going back, it helps in some ways. It helps maybe to see if we can get right some of the things that puzzled us as we wrote up our data subsequently. It enables us to ask questions again, which we didn't really resolve properly or to ask new questions and what new circumstances mean for the people in these places. And it enables to, to ask us, uh, what's it that perplexes us about that book that we still can't really get the answer to? It's actually, 99.9% .9 of that book is superb in terms of the detail and what he concluded. 0.1% is totally wrong, and yet it's the key 0.1% in the book, and it's so frustrating, uh, and I've argued about him with that, but anyway, that's another, another question. But it raises various kinds of questions which are common in the sciences, of course, is how we get a proper evidence base. Is something replicable over time? Can we go back and see those things again, or is it inevitably going to change and be something different? Okay, <clears throat> so going back helps in a lot of ways. Um, it helps because you should, or know rather more about the language, you know more, you're more familiar with the place that you're returning to because you were there before. Uh, so you can start off not from scratch, but uh, with, with more knowledge and so on. And I think particularly uh, there's a degree of trust and acceptance which wouldn't ordinarily be there for somebody going often for the first time. So I remember somebody saying, to, not, not to me, but to a colleague in similar circumstances, who said, oh, when you first came, we remember your university told you to go. They said, you've got to go there and get your PhD. And now you've come back. We know that you've come back because you like us. And that's great. We're pleased to see you. And it, it was a little bit, it felt like that going back, that there was this great, this much more obvious social relationship uh, a sort of mutual understanding in some, uh, in, in some ways. Uh, when you go back also, I think it's important, sometimes you can go back in a different season or in my most recent examples, you can go back after crises and those enable you to rethink particular activities, particular circumstances in a different kind of way. There are new informants, there are new leaders, They've taken over new kinds of wisdom. How is that working out? And so on. So for hopefully you go from a degree of naivety initially, gullibility perhaps, to be a little bit more confident, a little bit more critical as well, and taking that knowledge, the initial knowledge, a little bit further. Okay, so a cautionary note. Many people, in fact, do go back despite what I said earlier, but they don't stay for very long. And they usually see what they expect to see. So um, there are various assumptions and expectations that we make. And some of those are fairly obvious. You go back and you see things that weren't there before. Oh, look, there's a car. Whoa, a laptop computer, a smartphone. Exactly what you expect to see. Modernity is arriving, is creeping in. And so you see all these kinds of things more commerce, perhaps. Maybe you can see there's more individualism. 
Foods have changed, they're more modern, they're more likely to be imported than local. Capitalism is there in various forms. People are now migrating away, often from villages, sometimes to town, sometimes to take up different kinds of employment somewhere else, and so on. And of course, culture has changed. It's become perhaps a little bit more materialistic, or it seems to be that way, less likely to be as self-reliant and <clears throat> local as it was before. And those are all the kinds of things we expect to see. So we see them, but we don't see some of the things that haven't changed, that are more stable, that are still there. Like in the case of CY, particularly the kinship structure. Kinship structure is the same and yet is critically important. You can't see, see kinship structure, but it's there and is extremely important. You can see also when you, when um, obvious environmental pressures in many places, and CY is a good example, as any population is increasing. It has an impact on the environment, and it's usually the one that you expect to see that biodiversity has declined, in particular, species, plants, whatever, have disappeared in some cases. Okay, so you can see all these activities which we loosely subsume as globalization. When I went back um, after the crisis, disguised as a missionary, um, I, one, of the, one of the first things I noticed in the village, I was very unsure what it was going to be like because. Uh, they've been reduced to, well, basically reduced to basic subsistence for about five years. We're now coming out of that particular problem. I saw coming towards me a guy wearing an old Manchester United sh shirt. I thought, much as I hate Manchester United, I was actually quite glad to see that because it sort of symbolized that things were getting a little bit back to normal, uh, that those kind of patterns of change were occurring. So, um, so all kinds of changes. Um, and I think many of those, when we go back, we see as negative things. We see culture changing as being a negative thing. It's not local. It involves things coming from outside. We prefer it to be local. We prefer it to be their culture in their place uh, and so on, rather than something that is global, something about Manchester United shirts and so on and so forth. Okay, we'll come back onto some of that. Okay, uh, getting there. When I... When I so say these, these pictures are from last time, um, last time I went, uh, getting there is now more difficult than it was 50 years ago. There were now to get to CY and South Bougainville, you have to pass through seven rivers driving like this. That's the only picture my vehicle was stable enough to actually get it with that camera going uh, totally blurred. So we went through seven rivers of that kind to get there. Prior to that, there were three. So things have deteriorated over that 50 year period. Um, to actually get there, uh, I had to go through this checkpoint. Um, and one of the things that uh, one of the outcomes of the crisis is, is that there are people in uh, the area very close to the mine who are dissident to the rest of the country. They want to see, they see the world in a different kind of way. They are the owners of the resource at the mine site and they want to do different kinds of things. So here I was going through this checkpoint and I said, excuse me, who are you? And I said, well, I'm doing this. And they said, right, where's your, you need a visa. So I had to fork out $50 to pay for a visa on the scrap of paper, which was, which was given to me, and I was way through. This is the so-called Republic of Mekamui uh, in the middle of the island. So as the only uh, white man with long range, it wasn't too difficult to single me out to, to pay my visa fee and get there. And then we do, in fact, go back and find that there are still a few old men there, and you can actually talk to them and get on with doing a bit of field work and finding out what has changed and what has not changed. <clears throat> Okay, so what has changed in the recent years? Population has continued to grow. Um, when you ask people about, you know, one of my one of my closest friends in, in the village, I stayed mostly in, in two villages, in, in particular one. Uh, so I'm mostly talking about one village. Um, one of my friends in that village had had twelve children. I used to say, well, you know. 10 or 12 is kind of a lot, isn't it? It's almost two more than many people have. Um, so yeah, but God will provide. That's fine. We'll be, we'll be right. And they were aghast and they asked me how many children I'd got. And I said, well, actually, not quite 12. In fact, only one. 
and they were aghast at my lack of productivity. It just didn't seem right somehow. So population is going far. Birth intervals, I measured them where I could, was close together um, <clears throat> uh, six years ago as they were in the 1970s. So, so in that sense, rather little had changed. Um, life expectancy, however, hadn't really increased. It was about the same, so people were probably rather less than it was. A bit difficult to measure, but perhaps rather less. People were getting married younger. <clears throat> The phrase that the, the old man gave me was, look at their liking. You see someone and you like them and that's it. You know, whereas before it was more or less it was supposed to be arranged and there were traditional things that had to be done. Uh, certainly you didn't just look at someone and say, right, let's go and do it. Um, <clears throat> but, but, and I underpin that, uh, what was central to, to marriage has always been in Bougainville, we can see why, is cross-cousin marriage. By, cousins and that would change land tenure structures and that was still happening people were looking and liking but they were confining their liking to a number of people to whom it was appropriate that they, they married land had become much more important as population grew so the village was fragmenting um, in the 1920s when the australian administration got there hundred years ago, they grouped people into what they call line villages. The first two or three pictures in that book uh, will show you some nice examples of, of the line villages. They grouped people into these lines for ease of administration. That worked um, not too badly, really. Um, but now, because of land has uh, greater significance and there's more pressure on it, people are now moving away from those lines, settling back close to their own land. Um, Nine, possession is 90% of the law and so on and so forth. Um, and so the, the, the line of villages were gradually breaking up as people went about their own particular affairs. And the villages themselves were spreading out. People would say, oh, he lives, he lives in the countryside, using the English phrase. He's way out of town, moved off there. Or they would say, oh, he's gone to one mile, which is how you talk about su suburbs in Port Moresby. Um, <clears throat> Something else was happening as well. The book which, you, which is passing around there somewhere was generally regarded as being um, highly important because, of course, it was their story. Um, not many people had ever seen the book, let alone read it. Um, so they would keep asking me, Oliver, has he, has he put down our story? I said, he's put down. So he's put all about land tenure in there. He's put some things about land tenure. So can, we, can you tell us? where the land boundaries are. Of course, you can't possibly tell anything like that from that book in any way. But it was believed that this, in a sense, was almost the Bible of Siwa, like the definitive statement of what land ownership and life was like uh, and could be referred to and, and used. <clears throat> okay, agriculture was, was intensifying. Um, people are now planting in mounds because fallow times had been reduced, the pressure on land, uh, was much greater than it was before. People were switching from sweet potato to things like plantain bananas and cassava, uh, less nutritional value, easier to grow on degraded soils or soils with limited fallow. Um, and on top of that, modern diets were coming in, rice, noodles, sugar, uh, coffee, et cetera, et cetera. So we we'll see some of these changes quickly. Um, so here's the planting, uh, the planting on mounds. When I first went, there was not that mounding, it's just basically flat surfaces. Um, so that's sweet potato going in mounds, bananas, and so on. Um, here's another, another, not quite an example of that, but, but still a degree of complexity in the gardens of, uh, of bananas, uh, sweet potato, cassava, and so on. Um, cooking, this is my classificatory sister on the left, uh, who always insists on looking after me when I get back to the get back to the village. So we're cooking plant, uh, bananas here and basically um, as it's always been done in many ways. Although people would often talk to me about this, they would say things like, oh, you know, in the old days, we used to plant things in clay pots. Gosh, they tasted so good. And I could see the clay pots sitting there on the side. So oh, why don't we do it? Oh, too much time. So why wouldn't we bother? Uh, tastes so good. Um, Oh, you just throw your bananas, your plantain bananas uh, on top of the cooking system like that. Um, many, many meals, however, came like that for me because um, I wasn't really in charge of my own 
cuisine while I was there. Um, so it's, there's these kinds of noodles, hard navy biscuits, tremendous things. You could lose teeth trying to get through those things. Um, but there's a, there's a reasonable combination of uh, large quantities of rice, local food, and so on and so forth. Uh, a number of, come on to the second, a number of people now moved away and live in town. Um, I was here at the house of some people who moved into the urban center of Bougainville, and this is the first food they gave me. These beautiful sausage sandwiches here, lamingtons, um, and so on. In fact, I think that's probably the same bag that I have here looking on the side. I didn't realize that. Um, this is an urban diet. Well, you can see what's going on here. There's no fresh content whatsoever. It explains why the guy in this house had uh, very bad diabetes, uh, had part of a leg amputated, and why, uh, partly why non-communicable diseases are increasingly significant. Cash crops are, are highly important, of course. Um, land has given way, well, not given way, land has been planted with cocoa. Cocoa is the key cash crop in Bougainville. Um, at various times in the past, um, people have tried other kinds of things, but cocoa is always dominated. Uh, when I went back in just before the crisis in the 1980s, the, Bergen, the CY leader said to me at the time, he said, he says, we are all millionaires now. And there's a sort of trajectory that cocoa had made a lot of people very rich. But they were constantly trying other kinds of things, vanilla, chilies, um, just in case it didn't work. Co coconuts were always there, so copper was produced if the prices fell. So there's always a focus on some kind of cash crop activity, but it almost always resounded uh, to cocoa in the end. People were making mar small market sales, uh, roadside stores, people selling uh, homemade, selling little, small quantities of vegetables, homemade donuts, those kinds of things. So it's diversifying as well. Um, a small scale market production. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the cocoa, um, uh, cocoa dryer in the village, uh, copper or coconuts waiting to be turned into copper. These are beyond beyond them are the cocoa trees. Uh, and, and coconut palms, of course. That's my mate, the, the father of the 12 children. Um, and, and a small roadside market selling donuts of this kind, uh, betel nut. You probably, I'm sure you've all tried betel nut at one point, irresistible stuff if you want to get your teeth suitably red and feel good. Um, and small market production by women as well. So there's all this kind of marketing going on um, in, in various kinds of places. A big question is then, under, under, this, under pressure then, is there environmental degradation occurring? Some of the things that are being bought from outside, pesticides, not necessarily totally good. Um, chainsaws, chainsaws are extremely popular. Um, people clear much more effectively with chainsaws than they've ever done in the past. If you look at the whole history of seasonal workers in Australia, every single group of people seem to take chainsaws back to them. Vanuatu must be absolutely full of chainsaws. Um, but these are, these are some of the things that, that make you ponder and think, hang on, are all these things coming in? Is this good for the environment? And the second time I went back, I remember that I'd always liked freshwater possums, uh, freshwater possums. <laughs> That's, that's a new special bug in really species, the freshwater possum, uh, freshwater prawns. And the second time I went back, I didn't get any. And I initially concluded that, um, that, that since everybody knew that I really liked them, that the prawns had disappeared under the weight of pesticides, under the weight of people washing their clothes in the river. That's where you washed your clothes. So all that detergent was, was going down the system more and more of it all the time. So, um, I was also worried that, that possums had gone as well. The last time I was there six years ago, prawns were back on the menu. So again, it's, it sort of suggested that you, know, you can go back once and you can not see prawns, but you go back another time and actually they are there. You're just unlucky at that particular time. So, so a short-term judgment or conclusion doesn't necessarily always work. Um, possums, possums were still there. Um, on the, my last night, the last time I talked to one of my best friends in the village. I remember those days when we used to go hunting possums. Oh, that was a 
good old days. Said, yeah, we should do that. I said, look, I'm, I said, I'm a bit tired. I think I'll just sleep tonight since I've got to go tomorrow. He said, oh, don't worry, I'll go and shoot a few possums. Um, so, um, <laughs> spoiler alert, vegetarians look away. Um, this, is, this is him with one of the possums that he shot overnight. Um, and he was going to wrap it up in a nice plastic bag so I could munch on it as I went back to the capital city and, and onwards. I persuaded him that that might not work terribly well. And he could actually have it himself. Um, so that, that's, that's a, it was also a good example of what happens when you chew a lot of beef and that. That's what happens to your teeth and you can get mouth cancer. Um, uh, there was a lovely, I can't see it here, because it was a beautiful bullet hole right through the middle of this possum. What you do is shine your torch up into the tree. As soon as you see two little eyes um, <clears throat> shining back, you shoot them. Um, possums on the menu. Oh, that's, sorry, I forgot he was there. That's the possum beautifully shot through the middle and being, being wrapped up in the plastic bag so that I could take it back to munch on the way. Um, okay, so a lot of changes. Um, socioeconomic change, fairly obvious. What was happening, and, and growing frustration, in fact, that people were almost giving up on rural affluence. Um, they got so far with cocoa, but they wanted to get further. And they were frustrated that they had little control over how it worked. They could only plant so much because they only had so much land themselves. They were dependent on prices, but nobody, certainly in the village, knew much about how prices were determined. So they were, they were fixed somewhere outside of the world and they had no control over those things. So there's enormous frustration um, about rural development and about the fact that, that in the 1980s when the price had boomed and everybody was planting furiously, it was a kind of golden age. How could they get back to that golden age? Their needs were increasing. The obvious need was for, for school fees, um, Wants were increasing, people now wanted things like solar panels, chainsaws, and so on and so forth. And the cost of living was, was going up. But how could you solve those problems in CY itself? People's expectations were increasing. They wanted things like solar panels, despite the fact it rained most of the time. Um, they wanted to top up their smartphones. No, it struck me that one of the changes was that in the 1970s when I first went, I took pictures of them, and now they had smartphones, they all took pictures of me this time. So complete reversal of how the world works, um, and so on. So um, actually, what uh, so uh, people were beginning also to see themselves relationally or if you like, geographically. They were now more mobile. They could see where they were compared with other people. They could see that other people had certain things that they didn't have. And that, um, so no longer were they just see white people, but they were now experiencing a wider world, a context in which there were some good things, some things that would, might be valuable to them. Um, they also, um, this is a phrase from the, the late, a new geographer, Diana Howlett, she talks of a terminal peasantry. People go in and go so far in a rural sense. Um, if, if you read uh, Tanya Lee on, on Land's End in uh, Sulawesi in Indonesia, she talks about the same kinds of things. There's a limit to how far you can go in, in a rural context before, well, before there's a limit. So, okay, let's move on from that. Um, so one of the things that were, was happening um, Basically, it never really happened before, at least not in, not in the last century, was now that people were moving away. They were going to live in Booker, the capital of Bougainville. They're going to Kimby, which is the oil palm, uh, for, sorry, um, oil palm, um, palm oil uh, center in New Britain. They're going to the capital city, Moresby. So people were now scattering around. They were seeing options, they were seeing possibilities. They, was, they were going somewhere else to try, try their luck. Uh, there were multiple reasons for that. Economics was there, and just have a go at getting a job, doing something else different. Education was very much part of it. CYs were generally relatively educated compared with, with many other groups. So they had possibilities in a wider world and they were seeking to, to get on with them. Um, people went because of talk talk. Uh, people used to, to, to social social problems. People would 
Um, so, oh, you know, he's doing, he's going, that, that woman around the corner, he's been out with her, so oh, not that again. I'm heading off into town. I want to get away from these kind of uh, intricate, messy social relationships. People are also increasingly marrying outside Suwa. When I first went, every single person in the village, not a single person, was married to anybody uh, from outside Suwa. In fact, pretty well everybody was married to somebody in the same village. But doesn't. Now people are experiencing a wider world, they're going to town, they're meeting people, they're looking more like him, and they're marrying people from other places in PNG and the Solomon Islands and so on. So population were changing in different kinds of ways. But what it meant uh, effectively for the village itself is, and for Siwa, that human resources were being lost. People are moving away, and often the people who move are the people who get up and go, got up and gone, and have gone into town for new options, new opportunities, and so on. So urban businesses were emerging. Uh, there was social change. We've seen that with HIV. Two people in the village died of HIV before I went back uh, the last time. Um, NCDs, remittances were coming in. So there's now a broader scale of things. Life is more likely to have this, this urban component as well. Um, this is the biggest, the biggest group of companies in the uh, in uh, Bougainville Island, which is run by uh, a Bougainville, uh, the guy from CY and a bunch of other people from CY as well. Um, the the girl on the right is from the village. Well, the girl, both girls are from the village that, that, that I was in. The one on the, the right is the daughter of a villager who married a Solomon Islander. So you can see that her, if you like, her skin color has changed a little bit as well. So people are not as they were before. And they say this: they say we're losing our car. We are not as black people as we were before, and it's just sort of slightly depressing in a way. Um, okay, so there's all kinds of, of, of social changes going on, that's one of them. Um, there are still problems of reconciliation, it's a particular thing to do with the crisis of 20 years ago, when villages were torn apart, according to who you supported and so on. The government is, is not particularly helpful. Um, the most distant place in the most distant island, the most distant in, in the country. Um, when you want something from the government, they say, sorry, no got money, can't help you. Uh, and they're very skeptical of politicians. Um, if you ask them about politicians, they say, they just talk sugar, that's all, just sugar, sweet talk. It's almost the exact contrast. Translation, how we talk about it. So, oh, they just sweet talk. Sugar that's all, that's all they've got. Um, so services are particularly scarce. Local government doesn't work terribly well because people don't have the resources and the skills or you know exactly what would really work at small scale in CY itself. Sorcery has increased um, in these times of tensions and frustrations. And if you put it, uh, if you and if you read detailed stuff about COVID and PNG, but COVID has also contributed to a significant rise uh, of, of uh, sanguine sorcery as well. Education has become rather more problematic than it was in the past. People are now beginning to say things like, what's it for? Why are we paying for our school fees? What are we getting out of it? What are our kids getting out of it? What are they going to go? What are their options? So there's frustration about that as well. And then there's what, all kinds of, of everywhere uh, what I call shards of modernity. Um, in a, in the, pretty well, in the next house to me was a little boy called Elvis. Um, somewhere else in the village was a girl called Cinderella. So, so little symbols of change in a different kind of way. There were washing machines there, but no electricity. Uh, there was a football pitch. I'll show you the football pitch in a moment. There were aid projects. There were fractured vehicles. There were broken guitar strings. There were all these symbols of things that had come in from outside. Um, and I think that was dominated particularly uh, when you see people's, people's T-shirts. Uh, this is early childhood education. This is something I've been trying to get, get funds together to support. Uh, and my probably my favorite T-shirt. Uh, my second favorite T-shirt, I think, was was Bondi Lifesavers, which, as you can imagine, means absolutely nothing to to people uh, in the village. Um, so there's the early childhood education happening. Um, this is a picture which could not have been taken um, 30 years ago. If, I, if, if 40 years ago, if that picture had been taken 40 years ago, she would have been in big trouble. 
uh, for standing close to me, and I would have been in big trouble for, for standing close to her. Uh, she was, uh, she's the only, presently the only uni university student from the village that we were in, which sort of made that picture possible. Um, and here's the, uh, here's the, them photographing me as opposed to me photographing them. Um, there's a derelict aid project. The place was littered with derelict aid projects of various kinds that last for four or five years and for whatever reason fall over, usually because there's disputes over land tenure, something to do with that. So, uh, <clears throat> so um, modernity has come in in various guises. I won't define what modernity is. It's impossible, but it's come in in various guises, whether physical, conceptual, ideological, and so on. And at the same time, there's been a loss of something called tradition, um, uh, whatever that actually means as well. But what it means is there's a constant source, constant search for order and stability, a constant feeling that we ain't got it right. What are we missing out? What would work? What would make this place a better place? Is it modernity in some way? Is it respect for our tradition and so on? So enormous frustration. Some of those like the one about intermarriage, for example, um, when I went back two times ago, um, there's a big project to do a dictionary because they wanted to present, there's no, you can't learn the language because nobody's put it down. Well, as a foreigner, I couldn't learn the language because nobody's put it down on, on a tape or dictionary or whatever. There's a project to do a dictionary so that they could have their language uh, formalized because now what was happening with intermarriage to outside um, CY, the language was disappearing. People were speaking pidgin English in the village rather than the language itself. So there's a sense that their identity was disappearing. And indeed, there are all kinds of words uh, floating in, floating into the language uh, from outside. Um, for example, various times when I was talking to people, words, think of phrases like sweat equity, food security, um, child abuse, DV, uh, those words were coming in, just nobody bothered to translate them, but it's so the whole language was no longer the language. It was full of these phrases and expressions from somewhere else. Um, I don't know why I put Sago grubs down there. I think it was because uh, when I first went, they fed me Sago grubs from time to time. And this time it was, you know, we moved on from there. We don't do Sago grubs anymore. Um, it's not quite right. If you travel anywhere in PNG or anywhere in Melanesia in the wider Pacific, the word respect sooner or later is going to crop up. People talk about the lack of respect of youth, and particularly, or certainly particularly men, particularly the lack of respect of women. So, and therefore, in the village, that always seemed to, to relate to whether they're wearing trousers or skirts, because trousers demonstrated categorically a lack of respect. So there was the point was that women were becoming, uh, I suppose, in the outside world, um, people who should be doing better in some ways. But men were rather resenting, resenting that process. And it was seen in their terms as a lack of respect for you, from younger women. Men's houses, you see one in one of those pictures that going around, uh, were disappearing, the last one. The last one was still surviving six years ago. This was a place where there was ceremonial redistribution, but that was got, that had gone. Those kinds of traditions were gone. But at least kinship, as I said before, was surviving. So the structure of society, the underpinning structure of society that made it work, that made land tenure work, was actually still there, even if many of these things, many superficial, were changing. Uh, and we're now quite different from what, what they had been. So here's, here's one of these men's houses um, and I, uh, with the slit, slit drums, which were used for transferring messages in the past before, before all kinds of other things like smartphones. Um, that's the, uh, the village football pitch. Um, what I really liked about the village football pitch was it'd been carefully lined, you could possibly see I've lost my phone. You can possibly see a line marked out there and the corner flags on this incredibly rough football pitch. Um, ironically, this was where the village men's house had been. And it was sort of symbolic to me as a transition. The men's house was gone, that old order of men sitting together, contemplating futures and whatever, had gone and was replaced by this football pitch. Um, 
At least it didn't have anybody wearing Manchester United shirt, which is probably a good thing. Um, there, were, uh, there were other kinds of things going on as well, as you'd expect. This is a, a nighttime disco uh, while the batteries are still working. And I quote Tanya Lee on this. What has changed here is that no paint and feathers, no carvings, no costumes, music or dance, no scary savages or noble ones, just a lot of poor people leading hard lives. Um, that's more depressing than I would be, and she's talking about Indonesia, but people, people, uh, it's very hard, I think, for people to go back and look and see the sort of discos of this kind, with flashing, flashing lights, and not say, surely it was a little bit better in the past when there was a more local Melanesian culture. And I think that's possibly a problem of going back. Okay, I wrote a book while I was there. Uh, this, this is it. Um, as you, uh, people wanted my book as well. Um, but the, the bugs had done that one to death. Um, okay, so in the midst of the quest for modernity, there's also a quest for tradition as well. Those are juxtaposed almost. Um, so people, some people anyway, were going back, trying to go back to an old order. So look, modernity is not working. We've got it wrong. There are all these problems, respect, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, let's go back to the system that we had before, before, if you like, before Europeans, before the global system and so on and so forth. So there were Ramapohu is really the, the four different clans um, of the village. Uh, we're trying to pull, or, or, sorry, the whole suba, and pull those together to a group to think about how we do things as we did in the past. Another group called Kissing Back Culture, that get back, return to culture, uh, were also trying to do similar things. So there were groups of people in different places trying to return to the old order of the past and saying, this, this is what we had in the past, this is when it worked. See when we were satisfied with lives, livelihoods were local and they worked. Let's see if we can do that as well. I go back to that. Ironically, since I was talking about the, uh, the things that, that, that disappeared, Rama, Pohu, those four um, uh, two word bits are actually, the longer word is, is a particular uh, symbol of a particular clan. And the clans, uh, three of the clans I remember were, were sea eagles, they disappeared. Uh, hornbills, they disappeared. Um, tree rats, there was a doubt whether there were actually tree rats left over. The hornbill one was particularly interesting because I saw, to me anyway, because I saw someone uh, on a previous visit heading off to try and shoot some hornbills. I said, well, you know, why are you shooting these hornbills? This is this whole symbol of your clan. This is so important. Oh, got to eat something, you know, get rid of these hornbills. Um, so there are all these kind of tense, tense changes. Um, um, so at the same time as some people were sort of thinking backwards, well, we had it right in the past, the old order did work, gave us peace and stability and, and so on and so forth. There are other people going ahead in, forwards in different directions, education, establishing small businesses, village stores, <clears throat> and so on. Maybe agriculture really would work, the cocoa prices would go back up again, we'd find something else, like vanilla or chilies or whatever the next thing to work. Or maybe, maybe you should put more faith literally in religion. There's a big um, evangelical Pentecostal movement happened for a time there as people adopted new, uh, new religions and so on. Uh, in the midst of my last trip, I was sitting in, in the house that I normally stayed in, and a guy came along from a village five or six kilometers away and he said, oh, John, I heard you back. Can you tell me about development? Which is not, that easy, not, not a, a, an easy thing to be confronted with early in the morning. And I said, well, you we sit down and talk about it. So we talked about all these things about education, business, which were the roads and which were the strategies and so on and so forth, what might actually work. I mean, it's really, it's a really good conversation actually for a couple of hours. And the end of it, I said, well, thank you very much. He said, put it in his pocket. He pulled out this five kilo note and said, thank you very much. <laughs> and so the first time I've been paid as a consultant, so, uh, five kilos is about two dollars. So, so uh, to, to provide you, I was so stunned by this, I couldn't, I didn't even give him back his five kilos. But there we are. Um, <clears throat> one other thing was happening. Uh, is this was probably the most interesting, bizarre thing of all. There were two sort of kingdoms in the country, 
Um, <clears throat> one of the kingdoms is the one I paid my visa fee for way back uh, near the Panguna Access Road. There was a second one. It turned out it was in the next village. And it turned out that I was living in the house of the Minister of Finance of the Kingdom of Papala, which surprised me somewhat. Um, it's become relatively famous. Um, uh, it was set up by a guy called Noah Mazinka uh, from that village, who now calls himself King David Pay II. Um, and it's a mixture of all kinds of beliefs where the Bible and theocracy are linked in to CY customs and are linked into monetary policy. So he was very, again, uh, the Bretton Woods agreement. So a very strange combination. Let's get back to our CY traditions. Papala is, is the name of the local site. Um, and mix up using our shell money, as we've done in the past, with, with new money and get rid of the Bretton Woods agreement. And so, um, anyway, this is what it looks like. Um, so here's the sovereign nation of uh, Papala and Mekamui in Tonu, which is the next village to where I was. Um, this is the, uh, the king's palace and the various flags of uh, places that are supposed to sort of rep be represented by him. Um, he has his own little standing army um, and there are a lot of guns floating around somewhere or other from the, um, from the crisis, uh, of plenty, of, plenty of weapons around still. So they came, this was a, I don't know what, what we were celebrating at the time, but they came marching in from off stage. It was quite impressive um, and stood to attention. Uh, and here's the king, uh, as you can see in his regalia. Um, usually has shell money as well as the crown. The crown comes, I think, from Macedonia for some reason. Uh, and here he is, and I had an exclusive meeting with him, having gone through um, his, <laughs> his, his uh, equerries outside to do the thing properly and sign the visitor's book and so on and so forth. I spoke, um, I was there for a month the last time. I spoke English twice. Once to talk to a guy who was drunk, because when, when you get really drunk, you move from local language to pidgin English. When you get extremely drunk, you go from pidgin English to English. And so I had to speak to this really, really drunk guy in English because he was proud of his English, which was really awful. And the only other person I spoke to uh, in English was this guy. And he had an extremely fluent, very, very impressive English, a really interesting encounter. And that's, uh, you can see actually, he does have uh, a string of shell money right across his chest. So there are all kinds of, if you like, dissident streams happening as well. Uh, people had their faith in education, in religion, in the kingdom of Papala, in going back to a tradition of different kinds, maybe migration would, would, would solve the problem and so on. Um, oh, so this is just the currency. They've now got uh, uh, the Central Bank of Bougainville. Uh, oh, there's money that's been printed somewhere. I think it was printed in Brisbane, actually. Uh, there's, there's 50 Toya, misspelt. Uh, this is the guy whose house I was staying in, uh, the Minister of Finance. Um, and here's his people using welcoming the new money and trying to change it. Um, not working terribly well, but anyway. Okay, so to reach some sort of conclusion, um, there's enormous uncertainty, as you can see, enormous frustrations, enormous difficulties, enormous tensions. Um, in getting towards an end place, which is would satisfy people's aspirations and satisfy development. So I just put in a few quotations, which I think are quite sensible in some ways. Capitalism is not so much a means of economic domination. So it's not seen as a structure here, but it's seen as a means of seducing the senses, a carnival of goods, an image of the future, a call to arms for the younger generation. That's a guy writing about the highlands of New Guinea. Change has not produced a glowing path of material improvement, social progress, and global conversions, bringing disillusion to many places and again from the highlands of PNG, a shifting of multipolarized of patterns, expectations, and disappointments. Put it another way, it's positive, it's negative, it's frustrating, it's difficult, it's challenging. Like Kairu Islanders, many are plainly confused about the specifics of where they wanted to go and how to get there. Some degree of vagueness, confusion, and consistency is part and parcel of culture. But I kind of, since we're confronting it, uh, a um, election at the moment, it's kind of worth reflecting and saying, where is that not so? Were we not uncertain about the future? Where are we not worrying about the different kind of strands that will give, give us and our children and their children 
good livelihoods, good storage structures, good development in the future, and so on. Um, I was going to say, if you uh, if you ever want to read a really interesting book and haven't done it already, there's a book written by a guy called um, Kulik uh, called A Death in the Rainforest. It's quite an extraordinary book. A lot of people hate it. Uh, a lot of people really love it. It's about a group of people in Sepik and um, at the other, the other end of Papua New Guinea. It's an extraordinary book about thinking about the subtitle, in fact, is uh, what is it? How a language and a way of life died, essentially. Uh, okay, I'll just move on quickly to finish off. Um, just put another quote in there. In, in, a, in a minute, Gramsci, the Italian Marxist. Um, the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum arises a great diversity of morbid symptoms. So this is what is happening here, I think. It's, morbid is a bit strong, um, but there are all kinds of symptoms and fragments and um, possibilities of change. Whose knowledge is important? Whose authority prevails? Is there people still in the village? The elders? There are some. Well, all the old men have totally disappeared. Who has the power to influence change? Is it the modern politicians in Moresby or in Booker, in Bougainville, the people who sugar tussle? Is it them? Is it school education? What is it? Uh, what will bring uh, a really positive change to such places? Well, it's that, that well-known geographer, um, Bob Dylan, I think has something to say here, which is, how does it feel? How does it feel to be on your own with no direction home? Uh, so, Sea has faced a particular challenging tra trajectory. Um, it had to restart from scratch at the beginning of the century, and it is now shredded in some degree of disillusion about the present and about getting to a possible future. Um, and I think that's probably, probably a good a place as any to leave it. I don't think I have any more pictures. Maybe I do. Oh, it's the end, that's all. That's all. Um, the sun setting over view from the house I lived in, in the village I was there, and ref reflecting about what the future tomorrow might actually bring. Thank you.